Welcome to my video on the wave equation. We will start with a derivation of the wave equation from Maxwell's equations. Then we will have a close look on plane waves as an important solution of the wave equation. For our calculations, we need an equality from vector analysis, which is true for any vector field. You can easily prove this equality when you insert all vector components. The delta operator in the last term is a twofold spatial derivative given by the scalar product of two Nabla operators. We start our derivation by applying this equality to the electric field. Then we insert Faraday's law in the first term and use the fact that temporal and spatial derivatives commute. In the second term, we replace the electric field by the displacement field. We assume that the gradient of the permittivity is zero or at least sufficiently small. In other words, we restrict ourselves to homogeneous materials. Therefore, we can take the permittivity out of the argument and place it in front of the Nabla operators. In the next step, we replace the magnetic induction by the magnetic field in the first term. We can place the permeability in front of the differential operators, since we restricted ourselves to homogeneous materials. Strictly speaking, we also assume the material being time invariant. In the second term, we insert Gauss law. Now we come back to the first term, in which we replace the curl by Maxwell's fourth equation. The second term vanishes when we assume that the gradient of the charge density is equal to zero. This is the case, for example, in a dielectric material. This precondition also means that the current density in the first term must be zero too. Finally, we replace the displacement field by the electric field, which almost completes the wave equation. Our last step is a rearrangement of the factors in order to simplify the equation. In vacuum, the speed of light is given by the vacuum permittivity and vacuum permeability. We can easily expand this relation for the speed of light in matter and we can simplify it by introducing the refractive index. In optics, the relative permeability of most materials is 1, and the refractive index is usually used as a convenient substitute for the relative permittivity. Inserting the mentioned speed of light in matter, we derive the final wave equation for the electric field. And the same is found also for the magnetic field. In practice, the wave equation means a certain limitation for real electromagnetic fields. The double derivatives in both terms restrict the components of valid solutions to sine or cosine-like terms. This fact was not obvious from the pure Maxwell equations so far. We will use this result for our next steps. Please keep in mind that the wave equation is no universal law, like Maxwell's equations. Our derivation showed that it is only valid for linear homogeneous insulators. The wave equation thus is very useful to describe the propagation of electromagnetic fields, but it becomes invalid at material boundaries where refraction takes place. The finding that solutions of the wave equation are periodic makes it much easier to describe wave propagation in linear media. It is sufficient to know the influence of the material on harmonic signals with fixed frequency. Any waveform can be decomposed in its harmonic spectral components by Fourier transformation. Since signals with different frequencies do not interact in linear media, it does not matter at which point of the signal path 
this decomposition takes place. Instead of sine and cosine functions, we define a harmonic wave using exponential functions with imaginary argument. The index omega is given here to highlight the connection to the above Fourier transform. In practice, it is usually omitted. Please note that real-world physical fields, like the waveform, are always real functions. But their spectral components, in general, have complex values. Please also note that in most calculations the complex conjugate part of the wave is redundant and can be omitted. However, whenever a calculation contains products of fields, it is mandatory to use the full expression including the complex conjugate term. Let us insert the definition of the general harmonic wave into Maxwell's equations. You can now carry out the temporal derivatives. The complex conjugate part of the expression is redundant and we can therefore neglect it. The same holds for the exponential phase factor, which is identical on both sides of each equation. We end with a set of simplified equations for the spectral components of harmonic waves. When we insert the harmonic wave into the wave equation, we receive the so-called Helmholtz equation. In this equation, the wave number is the quotient of the angular frequency and the speed of light. It is closely related to the wavelengths of the harmonic signal. The refractive index in this equation indicates that lambda means the vacuum wavelength. Using harmonic waves is in fact just a half step. To take the full step, let us use the four-dimensional Fourier decomposition in time and in Cartesian space. The spectral components in this case are temporally and spatially periodic. They are called plane waves because the surfaces of constant phase for these waves are equidistant flat areas in space. The wave vector k defines the direction of the wave propagation and its magnitude is equal to the wave number k mentioned before. You can easily prove this equality when you insert the definition of the plane wave into the Helmholtz equation. By a superposition of plane waves, almost any electric or magnetic field can be constructed. When you know the general behavior of plane waves in a certain medium, you can thus predict the further development of this field in time and space. However, this approach is most useful for cases where the real wave propagates in a certain direction. For example, when you need to describe the radiation of a point source, the spatial decomposition into spherical waves would be much more appropriate. At this point it should be mentioned that in many cases it is convenient to combine the real refractive index n and the real extinction coefficient kappa to a quantity called complex refractive index. When we use the complex refractive index in the definition of the wave number, we get a complex wave number. The usefulness of this definition becomes obvious when we apply it, for example, to a plane wave in Z direction. It turns out that the imaginary part of the complex wave number results in an exponential decay or increase factor. Therefore, optical loss or gain can be described with the plane wave ansatz just by treating K as a complex number without a formal modification of the equations. Besides its practical benefits, the combination of refractive index and extinction coefficient seems to be arbitrary. However, a closer look reveals that in fact these two quantities are not independent of each other. The grammar's chronic relations describe their spectral relationship. I'd like to close this lecture with an instructive example. 
Let us assume a plane wave polarized in x direction and propagating in z direction. In order to get the associated magnetic field, we use Faraday's law for harmonic waves. A closer look to the curl reveals that our choice of the coordinate system turns most terms to zero, because the y and z components of the electric field are zero. Two terms are remaining, but the y derivative is also zero, because the amplitude of a plane wave is constant in lateral direction. Please be aware that infinitely extended fields do not exist in practice. We will come back to this point soon. For the time being we conclude that the associated magnetic field is polarized in y direction. Electric field, magnetic field and wave vector are always perpendicular to each other in an electromagnetic wave. On the left hand side of the expression we now insert the definition of the plane wave. And on the right hand side we substitute the magnetic induction by the magnetic field. We end with an equation linking the electric and the magnetic field of the plane wave. The quotient of electric and magnetic field is a constant, which is called wave impedance. In vacuum, this value is 377 ohms. Although plane waves are a handy tool for calculations, they are purely mathematical entities. As already mentioned, no real wave can be temporally or spatially infinite. Therefore, the y derivative in the curl of the electric field is not exactly zero, which means that the associated magnetic field gets an imaginary z component. Perfectly plane waves would be perfectly parallel beams. But as we can conduct from our finding, every real electromagnetic wave is converging or diverging. For a beam with small diameter, the y derivative is necessarily large, and its convergence or divergence therefore is also large. A closer look reveals that a beam can be treated as effectively parallel beam when it does not change its field amplitude significantly over a lateral distance in the order of its wavelength. Such beams are called paraxial beams, and the closest approximation to a plane wave is a monochromatic coherent laser beam with a diameter much larger than its wavelength. That's it for today. I'm looking forward to our next session.